This is Smart Poker Study episode 214, Beginner's Thoughts, Making Better Preflop Calls, and Ace King. In last week's episode number 213, I discussed my profitable results from playing in the 14th annual live tournament turkey shoot. It's poker study time, y'all. Thank you so much for lending me your ears for another Q&A episode. Of course, also, thanks for sending in those questions, because without your questions, I couldn't be delivering answers, right? So it's going to be a good one today with some great questions and my equally great answers, if I do say so myself. But first, I want to talk about something that I really enjoy. You guys have heard me on the podcast. You've read my books, and you know that I really like quotes, quotes from authors, philosophers, uh, people in the movie, and rock and roll businesses. So I have a quote on my desk right now from Henry Rollins. And he said this, if I remember right, I picked it up from a Joe Rogan interview or a Joe Rogan podcast where he interviewed Henry Rollins. Here's the quote. I don't have talent. I have tenacity. I have discipline. I have focus. And this, when he said this on the podcast, it just really registered with me because I feel kind of the same way regarding talent. I I don't think I have much talent when it comes to communicating my thoughts and my ideas, nor do I have a talent for poker, like an inherent talent. I basically just have discipline and a love for what I'm doing, whether it's teaching people about poker, doing the podcast, or playing poker. All of those things, I have a bit of discipline and uh, quite a bit of love for it. Because of that, I have a bit of tenacity as well in improving myself and then continuing to give all of you uh, all this free content, you know, through the podcast, uh, uh, articles, videos, and, and all that stuff, you know. Um, I do feel like I have a bit of focus like Henry Rollins, but he seems so much more focused. Listening to him in interviews with um, uh, like Joe Rogan, he talks about if he's not touring, he's writing. And if he's not writing, he's actually out there getting experiences, traveling the world so that he has more things to talk about, to sing about, um, to do his poetry about, and to write about, right? Like this guy's constantly working his mind is going to be working forever. He's going to be a hundred years old and be just as focused and just as clear and coherent as he is now. Really good guy, Henry Rollins. I love it. But the basic, the the main reason why I'm talking to you about this quote is because quotes really motivate me when I read something I like or I hear something again. It pushes me to be better and to do better. So that's why I wanted to share that with you. And uh, speaking of sharing, I want to share my thanks to my Patreon supporters for another month of their support. These insiders are so incredible and I really do appreciate how they help me to keep on keeping on. If you want to so- show your support for the show, go to patreon.com slash smart poker study there are different levels of support with different rewards attached and with december here there are new insider rewards coming up right around the corner the podcast for december i'm going to release it on december 11th and it's about plugging the leak of poor bluff bet sizing yep burrs i'm going to help you bluff more efficiently And the insider training video, it's going to be released on the next day, the 12th of December, and it'll help you plug the leak of poor river calling decisions. So I want you to take the time right now, pause the podcast, and run a filter in your database for making any call on the river. If your win rate is negative, then this is the video that you need to watch in order to plug this leak. But in order to watch it, you need to become an insider at the $10 level. At $10, you get both the podcast and the training video. And at $5, you get the podcast. So once you begin your support, you're going to have access to the current month's reward, as well as access to the archive of patron-only content. So for just a few dollars a month, which is less than a buy-in for most of you, you'll support the show and receive some valuable poker content in return. So please go to patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy to start your support. All right, it's Q&A time. I have three of them coming today from Brad Olson, Jay, and Ryan Kane. Please visit the show notes page for everything I discussed today, along with screenshots and links at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod214. And while you're there, you can sign up for the weekly boost for exclusive poker strategy direct to your inbox. And if you aren't a subscriber yet, make sure you become one soon because I'm going to be sending out details for my upcoming free leak plugging webinar. Those details are going to go out to the newsletter subscribers, so you've got to be one in order to get the deets. Yo, VIP! Let's kick it! Gambate! Oh. 
So question one today is about what beginners should think before entering a pot. And the question comes to us from Brad Olson. Here's what Brad said. One thing I am starting to notice is that as a beginning player, I am not as positionally aware as I should be. Sometimes I will see a decent flop under the gun and start betting on instinct without thinking things through. When I'm on the button, it's a lot easier as I see the action folding in front of me. How can I keep my head in the game and be more aware of where the button is during online play? Alrighty, well, thank you for the question, Brad. And this is a great question because it's a common problem for beginning players, right? There's so much information being thrown at you with every single hand dealt, it's hard to keep focus. Um, and actually, I made a YouTube video specifically about this that was released earlier this week. You can find it on my YouTube channel, and I also embedded it in the show notes page for today. And hey, while you watch the video, please subscribe to my channel and uh, also ding that bell so you get notified of every video that hits those YouTube airwaves. So Brad, here's what I want you to do. In your next five play sessions, ask and answer this question before you enter any pre-flop hot. What situation am I likely to face on the flop? Now, there are four factors that you should uh, factor into your answer. The first one is your relative position. The second one is the likely opponents. The third factor is the pot size. And the fourth is how your range compares. Let's look at an example right here. You are considering a three big blind open raise from the cutoff with queen jack suited. Maybe the button is a knit. The small blind is a passive player and the big blind is a knit. And everyone has full 100 big blind stacks. So to answer that question above, remember, what situation am I likely to face on the flop? You could say something like, well, I'll be in position on the flop versus a weak passive player with a deep enough stack to get good value out of my stronger range and decent holding. So this sounds like a pretty decent situation to be in, right? Queen Jack suited in the cutoff, the button folds a lot, the big blind folds a lot, and the small blind is passive and is likely to call. Great, on the flop, in position, queen jack suited versus a passive player. Money making for sure. Now here's the second example. Let's say it's the same situation that I just mentioned, except all three players love to call and see flops. So you're in the cutoff with queen jack suited. The button, small blind, big blind, all love to call. Here's your answer to the question. Oh, first the question and then the answer to it. What situation am I likely to face on the flop? My answer? I will be in the middle of three other weak passive players. It's going to be hard to bluff these three off of the flop, so I might end up just folding with this speculative hand if I hit nothing at all. So because this isn't a great situation to be in, instead of raising to three big blinds, you might make it 3.5 big blinds or even greater in an effort to limit the callers. Or you could choose to just fold the hand right there and let the button uh, play with the small blind and big blind. That's totally up to you, but at least you thought about the situation that you could possibly, possibly be in before you made that open raise. Now, Brad, over time, these thoughts, they'll become second nature, and you won't even have to think about the question or try to answer it. There are many other things that you can think about besides these four factors, but those will come to you with time and practice. Just start on these four for now. And of course, thanks again for that question, Brad. Before I get to question two, I just want to hit on something. In last week's episode, my results from the turkey shoot tournament, I said that we had chopped it and I had walked away. Like the chop was at 587, gave the first place chip leader 50 bucks. So 537, you could say my chop was, right? Um, so 537 was the chop. I went to icmpoker.com. They have an ICM calculator. What this does is it... Uh, you can enter in the different pay payouts and the stack sizes, and it'll calculate an ICM chop, a fair ICM chop based on the stacks, right? So first, the, here were the payouts, 1,200, 600, 350, and then fourth place was 200. Now the stack sizes were about 20 big blinds, 12, 7, and then me with about 5 big blinds. According to the ICM chop, I should have chopped for $415. I chopped for 537. So 
you know, $122 extra over that ICM chop. So for anybody saying, Sky, that was a terrible chop. No, no, no. I made more money on that chop than uh, ICM wise I should have. So I'm even more happy now. And the second question today comes to us from Jay, and it's related to the first question. It's about improving preflop calls. Um, and what this was, I'm using Jay as a pseudonym. I'm not going to give this person's full name uh, because, well, I don't know that they want me to blow up their spot exactly. We've been communicating via email. They might get coaching from me. They gave me their uh, win rates and stuff, and we were going back and forth, right? But ultimately, when I was looking at the win rates, what I noticed from Jay was that Calling two bets preflop was a big negative win rate in the stats that they sent to me uh, in every position except for the early position. And calling three bets preflop, that was also negative in every position except for the button. So Jay has an issue with uh, just calling preflop, two bets and three bets, right? So this is really the first thing that Jay needs to work on. And for everybody else, filter in your database right now for calling two bets preflop. Filter for calling three bets. If these numbers are really ugly, like negative 10 big blinds per 100 hands, negative 20, even negative five big blinds per 100 hands, these are probably things that you need to work on. So over your next five sessions, utilize the calling ranges that you have. If you don't have any yet, go ahead and pick up preflop online poker. I give you calling ranges in that book. Pretty tight calling ranges. They will, uh, I guess, turn you maybe from a loose passive player into a tight aggressive player with these calling ranges. And before every click of the call button, you want to complete this sentence. Calling in this spot is a profitable play because blank. Now, from the prior question, you could simply answer the question, what situation am I likely to face on the flop? And that's just fine if you still want to work on your calling ranges as well. But I really like this question because you're calling for a reason. You're calling because you think you can make money post-flop, right? Like you want to see the flop. That's what the call is. You're not raising to try to get them to fold. You're calling to see the flop. And so if you're doing that, it should be because it's a profitable situation to be in. So once again, before you call, complete this sentence. Calling in this spot is a profitable play because blank. Now, you don't have to come up with a completely mathematically sound or like an infallible argument that a coach couldn't pick apart or another player couldn't pick apart, right? You just have to complete the sentence with any logical answer before you click call. Now, for a lot of beginning players, it might be pretty difficult to come up with a valid reason, right? But the more you practice this, the better your answers are going to become. So uh, here's a good way to complete the sentence. Calling in this spot is a profitable play because they are opening every single ace and every single king. And my ace-10 offsuit is ahead of that range. Makes sense to me, right? Totally valid, valid reason to, to make a call. Here's a bad reasoning. Calling in this spot is a profitable play because, eh, I don't know. I just don't want to fold my big blind. Now, that's pretty darn obviously not a valid reason, right? So because 2-bet calling and 3-bet calling is so unprofitable for Jay and for a lot of you, you must work on the situation. As you play over the coming weeks, over the five sessions this week, over the 10 sessions this next two weeks, you know, you want to create two tags in Poker Tracker 4. The first tag will be called no call preflop. And the second tag, go ahead and name it called preflop. Now, you want to use that first tag, no call preflop, every time you think about calling, but you complete the sentence and you realize, hey, this is not a good spot to call. Go ahead and tag that hand with no call preflop. Now, the second tag, called preflop, use that tag when you made the call. So in your next day, in your next study session, pull up the hands with those two different tags and review them. You want to take the time off the felt to justify your decisions and write down the reason for every call or every fold in your poker journal. And hopefully at the end of the week, you might have like 50 lines written down, 50 reasons why you called or didn't call, because hopefully you've tagged and reviewed at least 50 hands. Here are some examples of things that you could have written uh, after you reviewed the hands or as you reviewed them, maybe things that you wrote down in your poker journal. I called because I ended the action in the big blind and my hand plays well post-flop. Yeah, that's valid. Maybe you said, I called to set mine with greater than 20x implied odds. Totally, that works for me too. Maybe another line in your journal was, 
I didn't call because I didn't want to go five ways to the flop with Jack-8 suited. Sounds good to me. And here's another possible line in your journal. I didn't call because the cutoff and button are very aggressive and they love to squeeze from those positions. So calling is less profitable than raising in general. So hopefully by the end of your studies, you'll have more sentences that begin with, I didn't call, than you have sentences that begin with, I called. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from, both fiction and nonfiction. Speaking of nonfiction, they have How to Study Poker Volume 1 and Volume 2, as well as Preflop Online Poker. And I highly recommend to get Preflop Online Poker as your first free audiobook. And the reason why? Well, it's more expensive than either of my How to Study Poker volumes. So get that one for free, purchase one of the other two, and you're off to the races. So once again, get your free trial and free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. Alrighty, last week I gave shout outs to half of the people who purchased some products during the Black Friday or Cyber Monday sale. And so I want to hit the other half today. So the Getting the Most from Poker Tracker 4 webinar was purchased by JP LeBouf, Omar Gutierrez, and Pertu Lanity. Thank you very much, you three. The Mashing the Micros webinar, Laura Sadowski, and Louis Sterling there. The Poker Mathematics webinar was purchased by Mihai C., Chuck Broyles, and Alex Sauter. And I mentioned Laura Sadowski once. She also purchased the How to Study Poker webinar. And Pertu Lanity also purchased the Expert Hand Reading webinar. The Rejamming Like a Boss webinar was purchased by Greg Vogelsberger. If you know Greg and you play with him at those MTT tables, watch out. He's going to be gunning for you. Or maybe be gunning for you with some of those shoves, those three-bet shoves to gain your chips, you know. Um, Eric Anderson purchased the Opponent Destruction webinar. Thank you very much, Eric. My Smart HUD was purchased by Dan B., Al Matthews, and Jean-Bernard Morin. So they are using Poker Tracker 4 and the Smart HUD to myrtleize their opponents. Oh, speaking of Poker Tracker 4, Kyle Roberts uh, supported me by purchasing Poker Tracker 4 through my affiliate link. Let me see here. Oh, How to Study Poker Volume 1. Uh, ebook was purchased by Paul Trevain and Ben LeClaire. Volume 2, How to Study Poker, was also purchased by Paul Trevain and Pertu Lanity. Thank you very much for those double and triple purchases, you two. And then Preflop Online Poker, the book plus the audiobook, was purchased by Raul G., and Lewis Sterling made another purchase here. So thank you all so very much for supporting me during the Black Friday Cyber Monday sale. I appreciate it. Alrighty, back to class, poker people. Our third question today comes to us from Ryan Kane, and it's about what to do when Ace King misses the flop. Here's the question. How do I play Ace King from the blinds after three betting a late position steal? And I completely whiff the flop. I feel like I'm checking and then folding too often. Love the book and online content so far. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. I do appreciate those kind words and the question, of course. So this is a great question, and it's asked by so many people. And so many, in fact, that there's a ton of content already created out there about it. Articles, books, videos, all that jazz. So I went through and I did a little Google search here for you, Ryan, and I found some really good topics that you should study. The first item, and I recommend going in this order, right? Study these three things and put a lot of things into action that you learn from these three. But the first thing is an upswing article. The name of the article is What to Do When Your Ace King Misses the Flop. Oh, and of course, you can find links to all of these in the show notes, so you don't have to go and, you know, Google them and find them for yourself. Just go to the show notes page. You can click the link right there. Now, this upswing article, I really like how it simplifies three different types of flops and how you should generally approach each of them. The second thing I recommend you study is a video by Ben Hales and Transform My Poker. The video is called What to Do with Ace King on a Missed Flop. Really good stuff. Highly recommend that 12-minute video there. 
And the third piece of content I recommend is from Splitsuit.com, and it's called How to Play Ace King When It Misses. Now, this last one from Splitsuit, it goes super deep and detailed. And if you like it, you might want to uh, maybe consider getting Splitsuit's latest book. It's called Optimizing Ace King, and there's a link right there on the show notes page for it as well. Now, I recommend studying these three items and taking notes, then come up with strategies that you can practice in game. You know, putting what you're learning into practice is the most important part. So study those for sure. But I also want to give you a little advice right now, Ryan. First off, pre-flop, okay? Your question revolves around post-flop play. But every hand starts pre-flop, so that's where you should always begin analyzing a situation. So first, just about ace-king the hand itself. I've trained myself to look at ace-king as just having an ace and a king. Too many players, they see this hand and dollar, st dollar signs start flashing in their heads. You don't want to allow your expectations of making money to suddenly skyrocket when you look down at ace-king. And then you said in situations where you made the three bet, right? Well, before you make that three bet with ace-king, you need to know what you're trying to accomplish with it. This is not a hand that needs to be three bet every single time. It can definitely be a good calling hand because it's ahead of most cards that your opponent is open raising with. And it can be a very good hand to call with, especially when you're in the big blind and your call ends the action. And then being heads up with ace king in a two bet pot, it really is a great spot to be in, even though you are out of position. So before you click raise on a three bet, you need to ask yourself, how will my opponent respond? If you think they're folding most of the time, that's great. You just made three and a half big blinds or more with a very simple three bet right there. Now, if you think they're going to call, prepare yourself for post-flop play. You want to ask some questions like, how does your opponent play the flop versus a c-bet when they are in position? And are they capable of calling here pre-flop solely with the intent of betting once you check? And what three-bet calling range will this opponent have? Another thing for you to think about, Ryan, is what is your c-bet stat in three-bet pots? Maybe your opponents, they utilize HUDs, and they know that you are flop honest when you're out of position in three-bet pots. So maybe they call every single three-bet of yours pre-flop with the simple plan of taking down the pot as soon as you check the flop. And you can determine if you're flop honest or not, if your c-bet is at 50% or lower for sure. Now, all these questions that I just mentioned, they're things that you should ask and answer in order to prepare yourself for post-flop play. And the answers to these questions, they might sway you to call instead of three betting with ace-king pre-flop. So let's go post-flop now. Let's work with the idea that you three bet for a good reason and they still ended up calling, right? Now, here's something important to know about ace-king. It only hits a pair 33% of the time on the flop. The other 67% of the time, it's simply two over cards that possibly have the potential for straight draws and flush draws depending on the board and depending on your hand, right? When you're dealt the ace-king, don't have crazy expectations of three betting it, getting called, flopping top pair, and then getting three streets of value. More often than not, and this is really two out of every three hands, 66% of the time, you will find yourself missing the flop. So now that you know this, be prepared for it. So we're assuming here that you completely whiff the flop. This is one of the 67% of the time where you do not hit a pair. Now, any c-bet that you make is going to be considered a bluff c-bet, right? You ultimately want your opponent to fold right now when you do c-bet. There are two things you need to answer before you click the button. The first question is, will my opponent fold to a c-bet? So do things like take a look at their fold to flop c-bet when they're in position in three-bet pots. You also want to consider the board and their range. And think about just the board itself, right? Extremely wet boards like 10, 9, 8 with two spades, that's pretty darn wet. And they're going to have a very good opportunity, or not a good opportunity, they're very likely, depending on their calling range, to hit some kind of piece of the 10, 9, 8 two-tone board, right? But maybe the board is dry like queen, seven, three, rainbow, those are pretty hard to hit. So your c-bet is slightly more likely to work. And so maybe they're going to be folding more often on the queen, seven, three. So the idea is the wetter the board, the less likely they're going to fold, right? Now, let's say you determine, yes, they can find a fold on this board. The second question you need to ask yourself is, how much will I have to make it? 
you'll probably have to go at least half pot, maybe even anywhere from two thirds to three quarter pot. You need to remember though that it is a three bet pot, so it's a really large size, or the pot is really big out there. So take a look at the SPR, the stack to pot ratio. If your opponent has few chips behind and they're basically already committed, then your C-bet has a much less likely chance of working. But if you started with full 100 big blind stacks and you see or you need three bet to nine big blinds, there's probably less than 20 big blinds in the pot. If they still have 90 big blinds behind, they aren't so committed yet. So that uh, C-bet is more likely to work and gain the fold you're looking for. Alrighty, Ryan, make sure you study those three things. Um, take some of what I said into, into account and then go ahead and practice. You're going to be dealt ace-king so many times over the coming weeks. Start three-betting up a bit more and then make different plays on the flop and practice these strategies you're learning. Challenge! Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Before every pre-flop call in your sessions this week, complete the sentence, calling in this spot is a profitable play because blank. Then make your play and tag the hand with either call to preflop or no call preflop. Take the time to review each of these hands and try to justify your decision. Write down the reason why you made your play in your poker journal. Let's see if you can't write down 50 or more reasons this week. And hopefully you'll have more I didn't call sentences than I called sentences. Now it's your turn to pull the trigger and dippy dippy do something positive for your poker game. You better wake up. The world you live in is just a sugar-coated topping. There is another world beneath it, the real world. And if you want to survive it, you better learn to pull the trigger. This episode isn't complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod214. Go there for screenshots and links to everything discussed today to see that video that I created earlier this week. And of course, so you can sign up for the weekly boost so that you can get your invite to the free leak plugging webinar coming up soon. Thank you so much for listening today. If you haven't already done it, please subscribe and leave a review within your favorite podcatching app. This is the best way, other than that direct word of mouth, that you can help the show grow. If you can type or say the word Smart Poker Study, you can find me on Alexa, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram. And if you have questions, I have answers. Send me an email, sky at smartpokerstudy.com. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring helps us grow. Until next time, study smart. Play much and make your next session the best one yet.